welcome to the Drexel interview. I'm Paula Morantz Cohn, speaking to you from Drexel's Westfall Gallery. Today our guest is Pulitzer Prize winning columnist Ellen Goodman. For more than 25 years, Ellen Goodman has been writing witty and insightful columns that have been syndicated in as many as 450 newspapers around the country. She is the author of seven books. Her most recent is a collection of her columns entitled Paper Trail. Ellen Goodman, welcome to the Drexel interview. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Goodman, twice a week, you Ellen. are- Ellen. Ellen. <laughs> I wasn't sure. I feel more comfortable. Um, twice a week, you're obliged to write a column, and that seems to me rather a grueling schedule. Tell me a little bit about how you feel about this, how you get your inspiration, whether you find it a chore to, be, to, fu to have the necessity of writing a column so often. Uh, Twice a week, I'm allowed to write a column. <laughs> <laughs> so they let pleasure. me. <laughs> <laughs> no, when I first started writing a column, I, I had been a reporter for 10 years before mm -hmm. I ever wrote a column, and my editor liked to say he was trying to get my opinions out of the news hall. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, so on, on one level, I think I was always interested in being in, in writing opinion. Yeah. My, if I may share my favorite story yeah. that, about this that came yeah. from when my daughter was little. Um, I overheard her talking with a friend and her, the friend said, what does your mother do? And Katie said, my mother is a columnist. And her friend said, what's that quite properly? And I heard this long pause in the other room. And finally Katie said, my mother gets paid for telling people what she thinks. <laughs> so telling people what you think is uh, both a chore and a uh, liberating or a privilege. Uh, I can see that. And so to do it twice a week, you know, that's how journalism is. You know, you do it twice a week, 750 to 800 words. It's beginning, a middle, and an end. You know? mm -hmm. So some weeks you have 15 opinions and some weeks you have none, but you write two a week. And I think that what, what, what the linchpin is, is the reporting. Mm -hmm. um, because like a lot of people, I open up the paper and there are lots of things that interest me. Uh, lots of questions loom out of yeah. the paper, you know, from why did we make such a fuss about Janet Jackson's wardrobe malfunction and no fuss about 30 ads for erectile dysfunction, <laughs> you know, to, uh, to weapons of mass destruction. Now that's morphed into weapons of mass destruction related program activities, <laughs> if I have that even right. Yeah. So yeah. everybody opens up the paper and has questions, but most people go to rather sensible jobs. And, uh, and you get to write. I get about to them. figure it out. <laughs> yes. So it is not a chore, from what I can make out. It's a pleasure. And but I, I'm interested in your point that in a way it's an offshoot of reporting. I mean, you were a reporter, oh, yeah. and this is a way of just bringing your opinion to the news. Well, yes. But uh, what I meant by being a reporter, I think everybody has an idea that mm. you know, you go to the office, you suck your thumb, and write a column about it. You know that it just kind of flows out of there. Mm. And in fact, uh, it requires all the reporting you ever did. For example, some of the columns in Paper Trail are about bioethics. Well, what I don't know about biology, you could write course catalogs about. I mean, you could write you know, mm -hmm. curriculum about. So to get it right so that I'm sure that I know the difference between a gene and a genome, <laughs> you know, I call people, as I always did as a reporter, mm -hmm. but the difference is that after you've gotten the facts right and, you've, and talking to other people has helped you form an idea of the story, and um, uh, then you have to decide what you think. And that's the difference between being a columnist and being a reporter. And you always have an opinion. You always have an opinion. Okay. Or and almost. Have, have you, you don't have to always have an opinion. And you say that even during your reportorial days, you always had an opinion and that was trying your, your editor was trying to extract it out of your reporting, and now, well, of he, course... he was kidding, yeah. but you're not supposed to put your opinions in right. the news hole. <laughs> Objective <laughs> reporting. Yeah. Um, you did begin your work. I mean, you worked as a reporter, but before that, as a researcher, mm -hmm. I guess, for Newsweek? Um, for Newsweek. And that was a very behind-the-scenes sort of job. And now, as a columnist, I think of that as the most sort of front-and-center sort of job you can have as a journalist. Right. Um, was that something you intended? I mean, are you somebody who likes to be on the public stage, to be uh, 
in the center of things. And did you intend that, do you think, when you began your career in journalism? Well, there are about three parts to that, if you don't mind my deconstructing, as you yes, say. Yes, take in it apart and answer it anyway. This is not a postmodern <laughs> answer, but yeah. um, uh, first of all, I was a researcher because that's all that girls could be. Okay. Everybody knows that women were discriminated against. They forget that it was legal. Yeah. And at Newsweek magazine, if you were female, you could be a researcher. And if you were male, you could be a writer. So I didn't choose to be a researcher, which in a way is a, it was, for me anyway, it's the kind of job where all you can do is make a mistake. The mm -hmm. only time you get noticed is if you make a mistake. Right. Um, so that wasn't my choice. It was an entry-level job, and I immediately started freelancing because I do. I did want my voice out. Mm -hmm. And then there is the issue of whether you want to be front and center or you want to think in public. Mm -hmm. You know, if I really wanted myself to be in public, I probably would have gone into television right. or something. I'm not interested in being a personality, a pundit, as they say. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, you, know, you yeah. know, when you go on television shows and they say the personality is in the green room, and you mm -hmm. want to say, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Who is the personality? Well, you're a personality right now, I have to okay. tell you that. Yeah. All right. but, you know, I have a personality, yeah. but I am not a personality, I'm I a person. Uh, so uh, there, there's a difference. I always wanted to be able to think through an idea and to have an audience. That's a great thing. But to have an audience not uh, because I'm adorable or something, which is hard at 62. <laughs> you oh, run I out of the adorable, adorable <laughs> question rather <laughs> earlier. But not because of that. I wanted to have an, I, an audience uh, of people who would be interested in, sh in the ideas that I was trying to share. Well, it's interesting you say that because so much of your column is a personality, it seems to me. So even though perhaps we're not thinking physically here, right. and um, I think you're very adorable, by the way. Um, so does my husband. <laughs> okay. I'm sure your children don't. I have children. They never do. But um, your personality is so much, the texture of your personality, it seems to me, is so much a function of your columns. And I would imagine that that is what draw, draws you to being a columnist is because, okay, you can research these issues, you can have opinions on these issues, but also you can exert that, that texture of self in the writing of them. Um, I, I think it's the issue of voice. Voice. Uh -huh. um, that I think when you write, you should write from who you are. Yeah. And uh, rather than writing as a disembodied authority figure looking down on the issue from on high and putting a, you know, yeah. ethical grid yeah. over it. I mean, I think we all should explain ourselves from wh where we begin, which is who we are. And for me, I began writing a column, too, at the outset of the women's movement. And the slogan of the women's movement, the personal is political, Absolutely. was meaningful to me both as a woman and as a journalist. Mm -hmm. Because at that time, journalism did divide. Uh, anything about you know, foreign affairs, politics, etc., was written with a disembodied voice in the, on the op-ed page. And anything human about values, about families, about relationships, was sent back there to the women's pages where you m could write with a more personal voice. But you were trivialized to some extent. To some extent, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But it always seemed to me that I wanted to write the way, in fact, people live. That you wake up in the morning mm -hmm. and you worry about war and you worry about your weight. You know? <laughs> and I wanted maybe, to write... Maybe in that order, maybe not. Right. right, right. Yeah. And I wanted to write about, uh, say, child care as a political issue. Mm -hmm. And a personal one, because in fact, the personal in that sense is political. It's funny because my very next question had those same words in them, because it did seem to me that you entered journalism at a time that men wrote the serious news, women wrote the domestic feature news, and you, I think of you as a trailblazer who bridged the gap, who made the public private and the private public. And I wonder if that was hard to do, whether you, there was resistance to it from those on high, and uh, whether you feel you've succeeded in doing it to your satisfaction. Well, when I first started writing, when I first started being syndicated, and I had six clients, or six, what, how does one do that? <laughs> I had six clients, not a whole lot. Yeah. Um, and part of the difficulty was that a lot of newspaper editors would look at the column and say, well, I like the column, but where would I put it? Right. And gradually, over time, 
Uh, partially because the issues morphed too, but partially because it just worked over yeah, time. Yeah. Uh, the issues that I brought belonged on the op-ed page and, and uh, were accepted there. But you know, if you look at some of the great social issues of our time, and when I was, when I was putting together Paper Trail, I realized that it wasn't just a collection of columns. It was a narrative of social change. Absolutely. So the narrative of social change and the issues that we've all been dealing with on the public stage have had a private piece to them. I mean, think about this year, same-sex marriage. Right. What, where is the personal more political, the political more personal, you know? Uh, abortion I've written about, changing family lives, bioethics, mm -hmm. you know? All of these so that, and, and then obviously other issues like war is personal. One should right, take this right. personally, you know. So um, uh, all of those issues, I think we have come to realize that the distinctions were artificial. Right. So that everybody has come to that perspective, more or less. Do you think less. that it is the, the women's movement that's largely responsible to, for raising that consciousness? And then my next part to that question is whether you think we have made great strides in that movement. I know you have been a feminist for a long time. Um, where we've made strides, where you think we've backtracked in terms of that? Um, I think the women's movement mobilized that transition, to answer mm -hmm. the first part of the mm -hmm. question, so that it put a different grid over life, and many, many people adopt that grid. And, and sometimes, you know, it's not just that the personal is political, the political has become personal. Absolutely. Too personal chatty, you know, intimate, up close, trivial. Yeah. Yeah. So that has yeah. happened too. And I think that's indicative really of a period of lopsided change that yeah. you ask the, the uh, how is the women's movement gone? And I think we've been through a period of rather lopsided change, that the women's movement was always supposed to move on two legs. Mm -hmm. And with one leg you were going to kick open the doors that were closed to women. And with the other leg, you are going to go through those open doors, transforming society for men and women. Both. And it turned yeah. out that it was a lot easier to kick open those doors than to transform society. Surprise, you know. Right. Right. So I think in many ways, we've been limping through a kind of lopsidedness of social change. Right, and we're still trying to get our bearings in that. I we think. are. I yeah. mean, many more women, and this is not a news bulletin, but many more women lead lives professionally like men, but we haven't caught up either in terms of as many men uh, leading lives that make up the slack in family or in terms of society making up some of that difference. So we've had a net loss of caregiving, which I think caregiving of families, caregiving of communities, and I think we're all recognizing that we've had a lopsided transition in terms of values as well. Right. I agree with you there. In Northampton, Massachusetts, though, where my sister lives, it seems to be a little bit more equal. <laughs> but anyway. Oh, no. Uh, and men yeah. have, uh, yeah. if, if men have done anything, I mean, I think two things. One, they have become the fathers they didn't have. Yeah. Many men are, have changed their feelings and their ways of fathering tremendously. Well, of course, men are doing more and women sometimes are doing less. So men feel better often and women feel worse because they're doing less than their mothers did. I think there's often that little disconnect there. But women also feel good that they're doing more than their mothers That's true. did. That's true. They feel so, more fulfilled in some ways. In, in yeah. some ways. So that they are, to a certain extent, it's still easier for a woman to think of herself as a success mm -hmm. because she's modeling, a professional success, because she's modeling often to a mother who either started late or didn't achieve as much as she That's did. That's a good point. So I think it's, yeah. again, See, I, still, I, it's I, a I joke. I keep arguing with yeah. two hands. This uh, yeah. is not popular uh, in yes. current. <laughs> in <laughs> no, but that climate. actually, when I read your columns, I'm always struck by this modulation, the two hands. Um, I, you take on very controversial issues, but you are never... Um, there's never, like some columnists, and some of them are very 